Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me OK in the back? Fantastic. Smith College acknowledges and appreciates that the space in which we gather today is built within Nanatuck ancestral homelands. We recognize our present day neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohican, Pequot, and Narragansett to the south, the Mohican and the Mohawk to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. Finally, we acknowledge and celebrate the presence of indigenous people here among us today. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm the director of the Botanic Garden of Smith College. And I'm thrilled to be back in this room with you all after two and a half years without having an in-person opening lecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also want to thank those, uh, in, or sorry, I also want to welcome those joining us virtually. Tonight's event is also our first ever simultaneously in-person and live streamed event. If you would like to be notified when the recording is available, please be sure to sign up for our e-newsletter digitalis at garden.smith.edu slash digitalis. A few logistical notes and thank yous before I introduce Saritha Brooks, class of 08, member of our Friends Leadership Council, who will be introducing tonight's speaker. In accordance with college policy, masks are required at this opening lecture for those in person, as well as at the show preview that will follow in Lyman Plant House and Conservatory. Masks are available at the door. Also in accordance with college policy, you will see speakers removing their masks. I do hope you'll join us after the lecture for the Mum Show preview and an after hours look at our current exhibit, No Somos Machinas, We Are Not Machines. This exhibit is a special look at the professional and personal lives of farm workers in the Valley, co-developed by our friends at Pioneer Valley Workers Center. It is imperative that I thank the people who made tonight's event and the annual Mum Show possible as well. Thank you to our colleagues in ITS, college relations and events planning for technical assistance. Thank you to manager of education, Sarah Loomis, for programming tonight's event. And thank you to horticulturists Lily Carone and Dan Babineau, student horticulturist Mike Kluster, Chloe Gold, and Abigail Dustin, and our entire class of 2022 summer interns for bringing the Mum Show to life. Thank you also to our dedicated volunteers for their help welcoming visitors throughout the event. Next, Saritha Brooks, class of 08 and member of our Friends of the Botanic Garden Leadership Council, will share a few words and introduce tonight's speaker. Saritha studied studio art at Smith before becoming a garden designer and horticulturist. She has worked at a number of illustrious gardens, including Wave Hill and Coastal Maine Botanical Garden. We're fortunate to have one of Saritha's designs on campus in the center room of Cape and Garden. Saritha. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Tim, for that introduction. I'm honored to be here to welcome tonight's speaker, to acknowledge and thank the Friends of the Botanic Garden and represent the Friends of the Botanic Garden Leadership Council. The Leadership Council is a group of faithful alums whose purpose is to amplify the impact of the Botanic Garden through service, advocacy, networking, and philanthropy, and to serve as thought partners for the Botanic Garden Director. For 30 years, the Garden's membership program, the Friends of the Botanic Garden, has supported the Botanic Garden of Smith College's student experiences. From the traditional first year Ivy, of which I got one, and now a range of genera more suited to dorm room survival is available, which I think is wonderful, <laughs> to exhibits, flower shows, collections, and gardens, bringing to Smith and the region a truly unique perspective of the world through the eyes of plant science, conservation, horticulture, and the botanical humanities. Thank you to our friends for making tonight's event possible. Will our friends in the audience members please raise your hand so we can thank them? Thank you. Thank you so much for your support. We are in our November membership drive, 
If you value tonight's event, if you enjoy the unique exhibits the Botanic Garden produces, if you believe in the power of plants, I ask that you join me in supporting the Botanic Garden by becoming a friend today. You can sign up at the front desk in Lyman after the show or visit garden.smith.edu forward slash friends to join online. Now, I am thrilled to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Marge Bruchak. Dr. Margaret M. Bruchak Abenaki, in her multimodal career as a performer, ethnographer, historian, and museum consultant, has long been committed to critical analyses of colonial histories and recoveries of indigenous histories. At the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Bruchak is an associate professor of anthropology, coordinator of Native American and Indigenous Studies, and associate faculty in the Penn Cultural Heritage Center. She also directs the Wampum Trail, a restorative research project designed to reconnect wampum belts with, in museum collections with their related indigenous communities. She has long served as a consultant to New England museums, including Historic Deerfield, Historic Northampton, the Pocomtuck Valley Memorial Association, and Old Sturbridge Village. Her 2018 book, Savage Kin, Indigenous Informants and American Anthropologists, University of Arizona Press, won the inaugural Council for Museum Anthropology Book Award. Dr. Bruchak earned her PhD and master's from UMass and is a Smith College graduate. Additionally, her research, insights, and willingness to answer an inquisitive email once in a while has been greatly appreciated and hugely influential for the Botanic Garden staff. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bruchak. Greetings, thank you. In the Abenaki language, I wish you well and thank you for being here. So tonight I'm sharing with you some snippets from roughly 20 years of research into Native American doctors and doctresses. And in general, when we think about historical and literary presentations of Native people in New England, many of these presentations focus on so-called vanishing Indians, as though Native people were doomed to disappear. And yet, a considerable number of Native people were highly visible in these towns throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, and still are visible today. But I'm focusing on the 19th century, when many Native people worked as itinerant basket makers, laborers, and most particularly for today's talk, as doctors, supplying indigenous medicines to their neighbors, whoever those neighbors might be. Now, let's take a short walk through this time period to meet some of these historical Indian doctors and doctresses. And I'll start with this image of a lone basket maker, because this is how Native people are usually seen, as though they are wandering through the wilderness. But I love these images to get a little more to the point. These are two cartes de visite of a woman known as Molly Molasses, or Molly Balassi, who is Penobscot, who is regarded as a powerful medicine woman and healer. And she also, as you may notice, crossed fashion boundaries by displaying traditional dress, here exemplified in her peaked cap on the left, and her everyday dress, the fancy top hat, on the right. And I found that a number of these Indian doctors and doctresses really like to appropriate non-native images of, let us say, status, like top hats. Now, some indigenous healers were willing to share information about their medicinal remedies, but many of them were rather secretive. One, for example, is Pequawket Abenaki Indian doctress, Molly Ockett. In 1807, Henry Tufts described her as follows. My kind doctress visited me daily, bringing new medicinal supplies. Frequently was I inquisitive with Molly, with Old Phillips, with Sabatis, and with other professed doctors to learn the names and natures of their medicines. But in general, although they were explicit in communication, still I knew them in possession of secrets they cared not to reveal. Now, one of the testimonies to Molly Ockett's skill was recorded in 1800, when she and her extended family were camped near Troy, Vermont, this is old Abenaki territory. A severe bout of dysentery broke out among the white families living nearby, and no remedies were helping. 
Molly provided a remedy, but she refused to divulge the ingredients of her preparation. The following winter, when a Mr. Elkins was traveling and found Molly on the road, starving quite literally, he agreed to share his supplies with her, and she was so grateful that she shared with him the nature of some of her remedies, including how she cured those folks of dysentery using a decoction from the inner bark of spruce. Now, Indian doctors and doctresses provided a very important alternative to quote unquote modern medicine, which in the 19th century was primarily bleeding, blistering, purging, poisoning, and liberal doses of mercury compounds. There's a reason they call it practicing. <laughs> now indigenous medicine in dramatic contrast was inexpensive, holistic, and far safer. It rested upon intimate understandings of the relations among specific illnesses, foods, plants, and ecosystems. And one of the most popular native plants was sassafras. Now, colonial settlers recognized the value of indigenous botanics, and one of the earliest that was shipped in large quantities from New England to Europe was sassafras, a blood tonic used in the early spring. In 1698, Gabriel Thomas wrote from Virginia, quote, there are many curious and excellent physical wild herbs, roots, and drugs of great virtue and very sanative, such as sassafras and sarsaparilla, so much used by the Indians, which makes them, by a right application of these plants, as able doctors and surgeons as any in Europe. Rather high praise indeed. Now, European folk remedies were, of course, carried to the Americas by European colonists, but their efficacy and safety varied dramatically with the skill of the practitioner. Some plants, like lady slipper or moccasin flower, shown here, were accepted because they, in some ways, duplicated the properties of known European plants. In this case, lady slipper was also known as Mer American valerian. Now, in rural communities, white, black, and native women alike would readily turn to an Indian doctress for their ability to ease female complaints and lessen the risk of childbearing through the use of blue cohosh, trillium, raspberry leaves, bloodroot, wild ginger, and other herbs. And many of these herbs commonly and somewhat pejoratively came to be called by Yankees by the names of squaw vine, squaw root, squaw bush, etc., which indicated something that was used by native women specifically for female problems. Now, Western Massachusetts was home to several quite famous Indian doctors, Two of the best known from the late 1700s through the early 1800s were the Mohican Zebulon Fuller and his sister Rhoda Rhodes. They traveled a regular circuit on horseback from their home in Indian Hollow, shown here, to the towns of Hartford and Win Windsor, Connecticut, and on to Westfield, Springfield, and even Northampton, Massachusetts. Their neighbors recalled that Zebulon and Rhoda sometimes were in the homes of patients and remained with them, and they also sometimes brought people to their own homes and treated them there. Rhoda employed local women as cooks to prepare indigenous foods, leaning heavily on corn, beans, squash, and venison. And visitors who lodged in her home often spoke quite highly of her recipes. One of her most frequent visitors was Reverend Warner from Springfield, who first came to stay with Rhoda while he was a theological student after being poisoned with mercury by a Springfield doctor. On the first visit, he stayed with her for a week, on the next, he stayed all winter, and ever after, he came frequently for a few weeks during the summer to be cured of whatever city living did to him. Now, in the 1830s, Rhoda's brother Zebulon was very likely the Indian doctor who was challenged by Dr. Chauncey Brewster of Springfield. And a neighbor recalled, quote, a certain Indian doctor had charge of a patient who did not improve to the satisfaction of friends. And so they called Dr. Brewster as counsel with the others and decided the treatment was not appropriate. The diagnosis of the case and directions for treatment were written out in the Latin language, and the friends were directed to lay the papers before the Indian and ask his opinion. When the Indian came to see his patient, the papers were presented to him. The Indian turned the guns upon his enemies, so to speak, wrote out in the Indian language directions for the white doctors to follow, and quietly bade them goodbye. With the shrewdness of the joke, all were pleased. The patient, of course, recovered. Now, this life-size diorama from an exhibit we created for Old Sturbridge Village several years ago depicts Rhoda's home as it was described in 1836 by a Brookfield printer named Homer Merriam of Merriam and Webster fame. 
Merriam wrote that out of desperation, he, quote, decided to try the skills of an Indian doctress to cure his chronic dyspepsia. He was, he was served with many different remedies, and he lodged for a full month with Rhoda, whom he praised as having a good knowledge of roots and herbs and their medicinal properties and a good degree of skill in the use of them. He also described her house, quote, one room was used as a storeroom only, and the other rooms were the kitchen, parlor, and the old lady's bedroom all combined into one. The visitors, of which there were often several, slept in the attic. Her son gathered roots and herbs for her and prepared them, and she had quite a reputation in the country round in the name of having cured or helped a good many sick people. In fact, one of her neighbors, Deacon Ellis, recalled, old Rhoda could cure anyone outside of the grave and even those who had lain in it only a little while. <laughs> now, Myron Munson, while interviewing town residents who remembered Rhoda, was told of one incident when, quote, a little girl suffered an attack of nasal hemorrhage. Physicians were summoned, but their efforts were unavailing. Dr. Rhoda was called. Entering the sick room, she looked at the imperiled child and issued the order, give me a hoe. And then she ran off to a wet spot, dug up some kind of root, and gave it back to the little patient with the bidding to chew it as fast as she could. The flux slackened and soon ceased. The plant she used was Trillium erectum, also known as wake robin, squaw root, Indian balm, birth root, or nosebleed. Rhoda called the red trillium go papus and the white trillium cum papus for their ability to stop or stimulate uterine bleeding. Now, one of the most efficacious native medicines used by Rhoda and virtually every other Indian doctor is best known by the general name of another Mohican Indian doctor, Joseph Pai, also called Shakwiathquat. C.F. Rafinesk, in his, um, in his publication on herbal remedies, said, the name of Joe Pye is given to Eupatorium purpurium in New England from an Indian of that name who cured typhus with it by a copious perspiration. Mohegan medicine woman Gladys Tantaquijan recalled that this plant, also called purple bone set or gravel root, was one of the most highly regarded herbs by the Eastern Indian tribes. Joe Pye weed reaches its height of bloom in mid-August, the very time when typhoid and other summer fevers run rampant. And this, in this way, it serves as a classic example of one of the chief tenets of native medicine. Many of the best cures are often growing fresh where and when they are most needed. Now, Dr. Rhoda used a wide range of medicines, including bone set, goldenrod, sassafras, and multiple other plants. Huntington Town historian Myron Munson described her materia medica as follows. As an apothecary, she gave prominence, let us say preeminence, to plants, flowers, and roots as remedies. She searched the meadows, swamps, and woodlands for medicinal vegetation growing wild. But her pharmacopoeia was by no means limited to such. It is remembered that she cultivated a great variety and abundance of medical herbage on the Fuller Place. Every kind of flower that I ever saw grew in her garden on numerous terraces still visible. And they are still visible today. And they grew most luxuriantly. There was a complete mass of bloom from the old road to where the new one now is and to the stream. These flowers were for use in making the extract. And this, by the way, is a photograph of the hillside around the remains of Rhoda's house today. Now that mass of herbage was boiled down to a tar-like substance that was then measured out in clamshell-sized doses to be diluted for further use. When treating patients in person, Rhoda refused payment of more than a token sum for her cures, in most cases accepting only a single copper penny. Now, the cures used by Rhoda and Zebulon included the following, but please be cautioned that I do not recommend experimenting with any of these casually. Indigenous medicines, when taken improperly, can cause as much harm as they can good. But this gives you just an idea of some of the plants that were used and some of the cases they were used to treat. Now, I also, by the way, do not recommend harvesting these plants in the wild, since many of them are now rare or endangered due to habitat loss, wetlands drainage, overharvesting, or other intrusions, including invasive species. Now, the Rhodes family also managed a maple grove, as did many native people, and these groves were considered hereditary family property. 
One local observer wrote, about the middle of February is the time when the Indians of Habamak and Housatonic, Stockbridge, leave their habitations and go with their families into the woods to make their year's stock of sugar. The season for this business lasts till the end of March and sometimes to the middle of April. Now here I should note that maple sugar was not a luxury. It was considered an essential food. It was the primary seasoning used for roasted venison, game, other game or fish. Traveling bags were filled with chunks of maple sugar, parched corn, jerked venison, and dried berries, collectively called pemmican. And Zebulon and Rhoda also carried maple sugar with them whenever they traveled, giving it out to children. In 1871, an elderly Northampton man recalled, quote, she was very kind to children, and her sugar box was emptied oftener by the lumps she gave us than by any other means. Old Rhoda understood what she was dealing in much better than our modern doctors. She cured permanently many cases that were given up as helpless by eminent physicians. Now, part of why the memory of Rhoda was lost is that like so many Mohican people, her family left. In fact, they left her behind. Rhoda was so well loved by her white Yankee neighbors that when the rest of the Stockbridge Mohican Indians left Western Massachusetts to relocate westward in the 1790s, she stayed in Indian Hollow. Her sons, Zebulon and Simon, traveled frequently back and forth between New Stockbridge and Oneida Territory and Simon spent several years in Green Bay, Wisconsin. But when Rhoda's health began to fail in her 90s, Simon came back to Indian Hollow to care for her. And the two of them were buried together near the homestead, and a local friend paid for the headstone. When Indian Hollow was flooded to create the Knightville Dam, their graves were relocated to the new cemetery, which is now right beside the high school. Now, in 1837, a formally trained medical doctor, Stephen West Williams, met with an Abenaki Indian doctor, Louis Watso, who was among a company of Native people visiting Deerfield, Massachusetts. Local newspapers described these visitors as, quote, comfortably well off for Indians, having several horses and wagons and a goodly supply of blankets and buffalo robes. And this, by the way, was at a time when most people in Deerfield didn't even own horses, let alone wagons. When Dr. Williams wrote his 1849 report on the indigenous medical botany of Massachusetts, he cautioned his readers against, quote, the marvelous stories of illiterate old women and Indian doctors concerning the virtues of plants. He claimed authority on the subject, having, quote, endeavored to draw useful information concerning medical virtues of our indigenous plants, end quote. And he considered himself the primary expert on indigenous medicine, which is an interesting choice. He denounced Rafinesque's medical flora. He denounced every Indian doctor he came in contact with. And he suggested that the virtues of the plants that were described by these people depended far too much on native people, on Indians, so to speak. And yet, Williams Herbarium, now in the collections of memorial libraries, is full of native plants. It contains dense evidence of the very degree to which he depended on the knowledge of the Indian doctors he met. The brown leather portfolio includes 556 dried specimens, 411 of which are indigenous, including Joe Pieweed, Slippery Elm, Ginseng, Cohosh, Gold Thread, Indian Hemp, Sassafras, etc., all found growing wild in and around Deerfield. Now, the samples include Asaram Canadens. Canadian snake root or wild ginger, about which he recalled, quote, it is useful in the low stages of fevers, in nervous palpitations, and similar complaints. When a company of Indians were in Deerfield in the year 1837, I was much affected with palpitation of the heart, and they were much offended with me when I refused to take their preparation which contained this snake root. They use it extensively in many complaints. Williams refused the offer of medicine, but he did not hesitate to claim knowledge of the cure. And he also refused to credit Louis Watso with having any scientific knowledge. Now, a telling complaint was preserved in William's private writings. And it reveals the fact that these Indians were not strangers who happened to be just wandering through Deerfield. They were frequent visitors. Quote, with all our improvements, the tendency of the times is downwards instead of upwards. The mass of the people believe more in Indian doctors and astrologers rather than in regular physicians. 
Within a year or two, I've seen hundreds of my fellow citizens chasing after the part of a tribe of Indians who came here to make us a visit for the cure of their diseases. They pretended to be able to cure all diseases by their simple remedies, and the people believed them. The chief of their tribe was called a physician. Now, this complaint is rather telling when we keep in mind that Dr. Williams was one of the founders of the American Medical Association, and his zeal to professionalize the discipline, he resented the competition from his perceived social inferiors. Now, Watso was not the only Indian doctor in the family. His niece, Emma Camp Mead, who lived in Indian Lake, New York, was also an indigenous healer, and she recognized the need to market her own cures to protect against the increasingly extractive nature of white practitioners. In fact, she utilized popular patent imagery and this rather fantastical image of an Indian on horseback who bears no resemblance to anyone in the Watso family. But she used this imagery to market her wares depicting Wild West Indians on her packages for camp's cures. And also in her packaging, she neglected to note that she was a woman selling this product because people preferred to purchase from men. But moving on. As the 19th century progressed, there was increasing confusion between and competition among real and fictitious Indian doctors. Since native cures included medicinal springs, some Indian doctors set up practices at resorts like Boston Spa, Saratoga Springs, and Poland Springs. But meanwhile, white doctors, both professional and amateur, rushed to capitalize on the popularity of native medicine with books like The Indian Doctor's Dispensatory or The Indian Physician. Dr. John Williams, a cousin of Dr. Stephen Williams, in his last legacy, emphasized the primitive setting of his research, testifying that for years he had plied himself in the wilds of America among the natives of the forest where he underwent all the horrors and deprivations incidental to savage life just to learn Indian cures. But the problem was, you see, anyone with a printing press could claim to be an Indian doctor. So for example, a white woman in Boston, a Mrs. M. Gardner, capitalized on native knowledge and on the popularity of Road of Roads in particular by packaging her medicine under the names Indian Balsam and Indian Doctress and advertising them alongside a strange illustration of a native woman in the Massachusetts Spy newspaper. And so Indian doctors decided they had to publicize themselves. Now many literally took their show on the road, traveling across New England, making baskets, practicing medicine, and putting on entertainments. When they took to the printed page, people like the Newell family from Penobscot Territory in Maine traveled around Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire selling baskets and performing in addition to Indian doctoring. And incidentally, when I first found this image at the American Antiquarian Society, people said, oh, of course, this is not a native person advertising. This is some white man trying to capitalize on native medicine. But in fact, the Newell family is quite well known. And, um, one of the interesting complaints, as you can see in the poster itself, a white doctor says that his medicines cure all diseases, but Dr. Newell does not believe it. For there are many white doctors who say they learn from the Indian doctors the art of doctoring in the Indian way, when in fact they know nothing about it. They advertise largely what they can do and put on the Indian name, but when called on for a trial, it is found they are very different from the genuine Indian doctor and that their seeming knowledge is nothing but false pretense. Now, it should be noted that some Indian doctors also competed with each other. At Great Falls, New Hampshire, Susan Newell, who was the sister of the man who designed this poster, was absolutely indignant to discover that an unscrupulous printer had replaced her name with the name of her brothers, who hoped to capitalize on her reputation. And then there was Samuel Thompson, a self-described poor, illiterate farmer who claimed to have independently discovered the secrets of botanical medicine. He also admitted to having learned some of his skill from an unnamed Abenaki Indian doctor somewhere in Vermont. Nonetheless, he claimed sole copyright for the use of lobelia, the plant he is shown holding in this plate. It has been said by Dr. Thatcher that Lobelia was employed by the Aborigines and by those who deal in Indian remedies and others who attempt to rob me of the credit for its discovery. 
They cannot produce a single instance of its having been employed as medicine until I made use of it. It's an odd thing to state since Lobelia was also commonly known as Indian tobacco. And it was widely used by native people in smoking mixtures and well documented. The variety called Lobelia syphilitica, in fact, was regarded as another important cure for the so-called French disease syphilis, which of course the French called the English disease. <laughs> Lobelia was also used in water cures, particularly steam bathing with hot water and sweating herbs. That practice was inspired in part by the Algonquian Indian sweat bath used by native people for spiritual as well as physical healing. In fact, most of Thompson's Materia Medica consists of indigenous plants that were widely used by native healers. A glance at his classification of remedies includes the following. Now, although Thompson was ridiculed by trained physicians, his system of publishing and patenting inspired the ever-increasing and still ongoing search for native pharmaceuticals to patent and synthesize. The Shakers even entered the business by growing and selling large quantities of pure botanicals, including both European and indigenous plants, with no acknowledgment whatsoever of indigenous knowledge. The Sabbath Day Lake Shaker community, for example, still markets their plant products as follows, quote, Gourmet culinary herbs, blended herbs, spices, and herbal teas that represent our long and continuing heritage. All of our herbs are grown in gardens more than 200 years old, dried in a facility built in 1845, and packaged in canisters just like those used by our forebears, with no mention of any of the native people who supplied that knowledge. Now, as more medicines were being packaged and marketed, Hucksters were increasingly willing to sell questionable compounds of liquor and bitter herbs as cure-alls and tonics, capitalizing on the inherent trust in the safety of indigenous medicines. Further confusing the matter, some Indians even turned to marketing patent medicines themselves. In the 1880s, John Johnson joined up with Penobscot Chief Charlie Daylight, Kiowa Chief Rolling Thunder, and Frank Loring, known as Big Thunder, to market Healy and Bigelow's Kickapoo Indian Oil, hawking cheap remedies to draw customers alongside traditional techniques to cure them. And of course, none of these native people were actually Kickapoo, but the name had a certain ring about it that seemed to shout exotic. One newspaper reporter observed, Kickapoo Indian Oil, Kickapoo Indian Sagwa, Kickapoo Couch Cure, and Kickapoo Worm Remedy were standard products of the company inasmuch as the contents could be mixed and bottled backstage for about seven cents each, and the dollars taken in as fast as the bottles could be handed out. The show was something of a gold mine. The stirring eloquence of Dr. Johnson, quite as much as his picturesque character, was an invaluable aid to the show. But again, I digress. These patent medicines, when combined with the uh, the myths of Indian disappearance and the town histories that refuse to report on Native people have almost obscured the real histories, the remedies, and the human interactions with Native doctors whose skills went far beyond simple plant medicine. Why have we forgotten these Indian doctors and doctresses? How did their stories become so disconnected from our town histories and from our popular memories? And working at Old Sturbridge Village, I decided to try to address that question in person. Now, in 1997, I decided to take on the challenge of creating and reenacting the role of an Indian doctress at Old Sturbridge Village Museum, knowing that I had rather large shoes or moccasins to fill. I spent months researching, reconstructing, and creating clothing, props, gestures, and language to create a character that went far beyond a mere costume performance. And I have many, many images like this where it was so easy to replicate the look of these Indian doctresses. I also found along the way, not incidentally, that many of the most famous ones were named Molly, many of them were six feet tall, and many of them had this sort of interesting allure and edge about them at the same time. So it sort of fit. Now, I should note that Old Sturbridge Village is not an original New England village. It's a 
it's a pastiche. Let us say it's an assemblage. It's a living diorama. It's a selective gathering of buildings, both original and reconstructed, characters, both authentic and reinvented, on-site industries, and interpretive choices that reflect whose stories are told and whose are left out. So the Indian doctress walked into this setting, and she would have historically in the time period, as a neighbor, a friendly visitor, a skilled healer, and a person of color who was sometimes welcomed and sometimes not in an overwhelmingly white New England village. The practice of embodying Molly Geet led to multiple opportunities to embrace and experience diverse life ways in a diverse time, including trying my hand at basket making, which I'm not particularly good at. But while creating these historic images, I also endeavored to recreate historic experiences. While walking through the landscape and through the seasons, I led regular walking tours along the roads, in the forests, through the fields, winter, spring, summer, fall, for more than 20 years. Whether working with staff, student interns, or visitors, I introduced folks to the astonishing range of native medicinal plants, Joe Pieweed, Sassafras, Sweet Fern, Boneset, Goldthread, and many, many others that are still growing wild on OSV's hillsides and roadsides. Now, the staff welcomed interactions with Molly, and my walks became popular events, but I still found that most visitors were slightly confused and sometimes quite astonished to encounter a native person in an 1830s Yankee museum. And so the questions I was battered with are, in retrospect, amusing. Are you a witch? Do you sell snake oil? Didn't all the Indians die off? Is that your real hair? And frankly, I can only answer yes to one of these questions. I'll let you guess which one. <laughs> now, I portrayed Molly as a pleasant woman who would doctor just about anybody, but my primary goal was to doctor people's misperceptions to overcome the erasure in public memory of New England Indians, to restore some understanding of the individual healers who were, and I believe still are, integral parts of these Yankee communities. And I quickly realized that my task as an educator, performer, and herbal healer was also to repair the rift between fantasy and reality, to bring the past into contact with the present. Because you see, in character as Molly, I could invite visitors to walk with me into a world where the plants still talk to the healers, where the Indian doctors know something the Yankees don't about medicine. And there's a certain mystery and allure to that. Now, during maple sugaring season at Sturbridge, it was especially effective to have Molly Geet in residence at the small house, cooking and boiling down maple sap to sugar, and of course, telling stories about maple sugaring too. Molly developed quite a command of the kitchen, especially when cooking rabbit, venison, porridge, succotash, Jerusalem artichoke, and many other native foods. In fact, I used to really enjoy Thanksgiving when I would be cooking everything but a turkey. Now, I often had to remind people that wandering was not equivalent to homelessness. Native people in the 19th century exhibited a great deal of autonomy traveling where and when they chose despite the prejudices of the time, and many, of course, had their own homes. Native homes were outfitted with native stuff, just as you can see in this life-size diorama at the Mashantucka Pequot Museum. But non-native homes also had a lot of native stuff. Because, in fact, many aspects of everyday Yankee life in the 1830s, from the brooms used to sweep the floors, to the rush seats on chairs, to the baskets that hold farm products, to the herbal medicines in everyday use, to the Ryan engine bread on the table. These reflected encounters with living native people and native technology. And so, in closing, let me make this point. We still have a great deal to learn from these Indian doctors and doctresses who practiced what we would recognize today as herbalism, homeopathy, chiropractic, and physiotherapy in addition to good doses of psychotherapy and spiritual healing. Their knowledge went far beyond mere pharmacology, including teachings about proper times and places and applications of healing. Although Rhoda Rhodes is long gone and Indian Hollow is now empty of residence, her descendants, including her five-time great-granddaughter Janet Gerzabowski, shown on the right here at what remains of Rhoda's old home site, these people still remember. 
and native foodways and medicinal traditions still persist across New England, particularly among those people who sugar in the early spring, gather berries in the summer, harvest and hunt in the fall, and give thanks for every plant, every animal, every creature in every season. And I should also note that many native communities are also very actively increasing their efforts to protect traditional medicinal knowledge, biological resources, and the endangered ecosystems where these powerful plants once thrived, recognizing these as collective other than human allies and heritage. By gaining better understanding of indigenous medicines and lifeways, and by recognizing the influence of indigenous people and indigenous knowledges in the past and in the present, we can also work to deconstruct the selective nature of the stories we tell one another about ourselves, about these places, and about the past, and about the future. Thank you. Be well. Travel well.